To Good Seats Still Available, a curious little podcast devoted to exploring what used to be in professional sports. Here's your host, Tim Hanlon. All right, here we go. Buckle up, everybody. It's uh, hockey time here on Good Seats Still Available, that curious little podcast that is devoted to what used to be in professional sports. My name is Tim Hanlon, and uh, I welcome you. Yes, indeed, we are back into the sport of hockey, finally. And yeah, finally, uh, an episode that's not about the California Golden Seals. Uh, it, uh, though, is uh, pretty interesting because uh, this episode is devoted to a team where there is actually some uh, delineated uh, connection uh, to those California Seals. The team I'm talking about is the Minnesota North Stars uh, that were part of the NHL for uh, quite some time, part of the great expansion uh, in the late 1960s, the same class, as a matter of fact, as uh, when the uh, California Golden Seals came in. Uh, so there is some connection there. But as we'll find out with our guest today, Adam Rader, uh, the author of Frozen in Time, a Minnesota North Star's history, uh, will discern, determine, find out, and learn, uh, maybe not necessarily in that order, uh, how the North Stars and the California Golden Seals uh, are related, uh, as well as uh, three teams that uh, currently exist in today's National Hockey League, uh, that trace their roots in some way, shape, or form to the team that uh, called Minnesota, Minneapolis, St. Paul, home uh, for a good uh, couple of decades, the Minnesota North Stars. Probably most obviously is the Dallas Stars, which was the direct uh, descendant or the direct location from which the North Stars ultimately went and their move. Um, and uh, of course, uh, there, was a, there was a time where actually they might have been called the Dallas uh, North Stars, but uh, I, I'm not quite sure. We didn't really get to the bottom of that in our conversation. Uh, but uh, the uh, the Stars, the name of the Dallas Stars, uh, lives on today, and a lot of the heritage has been transferred, all the records, of course. Uh, but there are also two other franchises that uh, can, can trace some relationship to the North Stars. One, of course, is the Minnesota Wild. The, you could call it the successor team in the uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul, and state of Minnesota market. Uh, and uh, the Wild have done quite a bit, actually, to, um, I guess, sort of uh, reconstruct the relationship that uh, the um, North Stars had uh, with the fans uh, in that region. And uh, clearly there is a, a relationship uh, and a kinship. And then perhaps maybe not so obviously, and again, we'll find out in our, in our chat here with Adam in a couple of seconds, the San Jose Sharks, believe it or not, also have some direct lineage and relationship to this team, the Minnesota North Stars, our second hockey franchise, finally, that we're getting to here on Good Seats Still Available. And we appreciate your listening and uh, stay tuned. It's a very fun and interesting conversation, as they tend to be. Uh, and our conversation with Adam Rader just coming up in uh, just a couple of seconds. A couple of promo things. Let's get those out of the way. Audibletrial.com slash good seats. That's the place to get a free audiobook and one month's uh, subscription, if you will, to the service that is known as Audible. 
uh, 180,000 plus titles to choose from. You've heard the drill before. Please, by all means, take advantage of it. AudibleTrial.com slash good seats. Plenty of good stuff to listen to. Pick one, will you? And you'll enjoy it. I promise you. And again, you can cancel at any time. If you don't like it for whatever reason, uh, your ears get too tired of listening to a book. Hard to believe you could say that. Uh, feel free to do so. But uh, you can't cancel it until you give it a try. And that's the best place to try it, of course, is audibletrial.com slash good seats. And by doing so, uh, you will be giving some support and some love to the show uh, and keeping us going. And we want to keep going. We've got so many more stories to tell and share with you. Uh, so please do that. Audibletrial.com slash good seats. And uh, we appreciate your patronage. Of course, we also appreciate your patronage of sportshistorycollectibles.com. Sportshistorycollectibles.com is the place to get all kinds of fun uh, memorabilia and stuff from teams and leagues uh, no longer with us. Hell, some of them still with us. Uh, and Minnesota North Stars and NHL and WHA, all kinds of hockey stuff among the many, many things and many stories uh, to uh, to delve into and physically own pieces of by going to sportshistorycollectibles.com. And of course, once you stumble across something that you just desperately have to have, let's save you some dough, shall we? Use the promo code GOODSEATS at checkout and you will get 15% off of your purchases. That's good seats at checkout. That's the promo code at sportshistorycollectibles.com. Visit there early, visit there often. Uh, you'll be glad, as they say, you did. Okay, and you'll also be glad that you did stick around for this conversation. A really good one with our friend, our new friend, Adam Rader. He, the author of Frozen in Time, a Minnesota North Stars history. Please enjoy. So I am um, uh, obviously before we get into uh, the story of, uh, of of the North Stars, I'm uh, I'm exceeding, exceedingly curious as to what drove you to uh, consider the story of this team and committing it to a book. Um, I don't sense or detect any uh, professional sports uh, journalism background, or perhaps I've missed it uh, in your background. But I'm just curious as to how you even got uh, interested in the topic altogether. Why um, there was a little bit of um there was a little bit of sports journalism in my background. I started out as a general assignment reporter. I worked as after college. I worked at a uh, at a weekly newspaper in the uh, rural northwest corner of Connecticut. Um, I'm originally from New York, but I I went to school in Connecticut. I started my reporting job in Connecticut, and you know I worked general news, courts, education, politics, crime, features, and it was very rewarding. I really felt like we were doing a community service. Um, but after a couple of years, it became kind of repetitive as, as small town news does. And I wanted to change. And I was also covering things that I just didn't really have the, I don't know. I don't know that I had the stomach for them. I, I think that there are, you know, when you're covering hard news and, and, and crime and, and some, sometimes some really uh, difficult subjects, you've got to, You've got to have the the tenacity and the uh, the drive and the the thick skin to be able to cover some some of the some of those subjects. And I I found that I didn't. And I wanted to cover something a little bit more fun. I had always been a fan of pro hockey. I loved the history of hockey. So I kind of got out of the community news business and. Um, Worked for a gentleman named Stan Fischler, who some of your listeners may know. He's kind of a prolific broadcaster and author based in New York. He's kind of he's more or less retired now. Um, but, you know, Stan, I worked for Stan for a year as a kind of glorified intern and, and research assistant. And uh, and that experience, you know, I worked with him on, on four different books, all in different stages of development, three of them on hockey. Um, and I found, you know, I'd always thought before that experience, I could never write a book. Uh, it just seemed like this, this mountain that I couldn't climb and was meant for other people. But after working with him on his books, I thought, you know, I, I can do this. It's, it's a lot of research which I enjoy, um, and it's a lot of interviewing, which I'm good at. But if, you, if you're 
if you're dedicated to it and you and you and you're willing to immerse yourself in one subject for a long period of time, you can do it. And I and I found that I I wanted to do that. So um, after working with Stan, I got into freelancing, and I covered the National Hockey League uh, and, and and pro hockey in general for a lot of magazines, most of which are no longer in business because we've had multiple work stoppages. <laughs> unfortunately, the NHL that have driven a lot of really great publications out of business. But I was a freelancer for a little while, and I covered drafts and Stanley Cup finals and did a lot of player features and things. But um, even that, you know, eventually you want to work on something bigger and and kind of focus on one subject. And, and around that time, probably around, you know, this, this North Star book I started a long time ago, probably around 2002, I started working on it. And I, and I and I wanted to write about, um, you know, I've always been a big fan of the history of hockey. I think what drew me to hockey initially, apart from the obvious selling points like the speed and the skill of the players and the physicality, uh, you know, at least what's left of it, I love that most hockey fans have an awareness of and an appreciation for the history of the game. It's one of the great things that I think sets hockey apart from other North American team sports except, you know, maybe baseball, which is – really rich with its own traditions. And I knew I wanted to write a book about the history of hockey, but I wanted to tell a story that hadn't already been told in any great depth. And I literally looked at a list of all the teams and was like, okay, what hasn't been done? What stories haven't been told? And the story of the North Stars, how they came to be, why they left Minnesota, was a really interesting one. This was a team that had some great players, some interesting characters. They had two Cinderella runs to the Stanley Cup Finals and ultimately left Minnesota, this hockey hotbed, after 26 seasons. So I kind of embraced the challenge of exploring that subject from an unbiased perspective. I'm not sure that a Minnesota person, um, and I mean no, no disrespect because some of the best hockey writers come from you know, have, have worked in Minnesota. But I don't, I'm not sure that a Minnesota person would have been able to do that because it would have meant being objective about Norm Green, who was an incredibly controversial figure who we'll talk about later on, but he was the owner of the team who, you know, he was the owner who ultimately moved the North Stars to Dallas. And I just, I wanted the challenge of coming in without any preconceived notions and analyze this subject in a way that um, that I don't think anyone had had done before. Yeah, I think that's interesting. And and you, to your to your point, we will get to sort of some of those uh, very visceral uh, issues and and people uh, in the midst of that. But I mean, you you do hint at you know your your previous comment. You know, there is sort of a I guess when you look at it historically, and and for many many years, uh, the the pro sport of hockey in the United States was largely a, a six team circuit. Uh, strangely, for as long as it was until the the late '60s, which we'll also get into, but there's almost sort of a um, I'm struggling for the word is it a regality, so to speak, right? Even even today, you know, in some of the names of the cups and the and the and the the, the, the deference to the um, some of the great founders uh, of the league and the governors, et cetera. Um, but I think it's also probably interesting too that uh, that the team we're going to talk about, the Minnesota North Stars, right, um, were you know very much ensconced in. Uh, a time when I guess you could make the argument that the NHL was sort of shedding its somewhat uh, noble roots, so to speak, and uh, in proper ways, if you will, uh, into something a lot more ru- ruly, unruly. And uh, and may- maybe the WHA was part of that, maybe the idea of just expansion and, and pro sports at that time. But um, it almost feels uh, emblematic, uh, the North Star story, of, of things generally in the NHL besides their own uh, particular journey. Absolutely. Um, the 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 idea to the the, it, the NHL was uh, was a twenty was a six team league for about twenty five years from I think nineteen forty two to sixty seven six teams and that's you know that's what we call the original six era it was Boston New York Rangers Detroit Chicago Blackhawks Toronto Maple Leafs Montreal Canadiens um, and am I forgetting one. No, that's it. it. Toronto, New York, Detroit, Boston. So, um, so those six teams, you know, were the only six. In the, but you know, interestingly, because of the the rules that were set up at the time, um, three teams accounted for uh, like 
25 of the 26 championships that were that were uh, awarded throughout those years. Detroit, Montreal, and Toronto won the lion's share of, of the Stanley Cups because the rules were such that um, teams you, you had the territorial you had like 50 mile territorial rights to every amateur player. Um, uh, for, you know, within your within your kind of area, and you know, who were the Rangers going to protect? Uh, there was no there was no amateur hockey. But there were no uh, star prospects in 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 Brooklyn or northern New Jersey. There were no you know Boston didn't have uh, didn't have the the thriving college programs that it has now. So the Canadian teams had a huge advantage, and they were able to build these dynasties and perpetuate these dynasties. And I think, you know, once you got into the, the 50s and 60s, uh, you know, they started to say, well, geez, you know, we've got six teams and the other leagues, football, baseball, they have a larger footprint and they've got national TV deals and they're making more money. We need to consider expanding. We have a very small footprint. So they toyed with the idea, but it was still, you know, at the time, amazingly, you know, only six teams – the idea of getting any bigger was radical. And there were some owners, particularly in Chicago, who were like, oh, you know, if we expand, we're going to destabilize the league, and the money we're going to make off of the new teams isn't going to be enough. It's not going to be worth it. It'll dilute the talent pool. Um, so it, it, there was no one really clamoring for expansion. Um, Clarence Campbell, who was the, uh, the league president when um, – uh, when we got into the 60s, he he was he was able to convince the other governors that look, you know, if you want to grow your business, you have to we have to expand. So they looked at other markets. They looked at other markets in North America that they thought could support um, pro teams. These were these were uh, groups that had to be able to provide a building. Um, they had to be able to pay the expansion fee, which was two million dollars. And so, um, you know, there were a number of groups from all over North America, some of which, you know, in cities that, you know, now have teams, but at the time didn't. Uh, and ultimately, you know, the league looked at Minnesota. They realized that Minnesota had this really strong history of, of, uh, uh, of amateur hockey. In fact, um, Minnesota really was the birthplace of hockey in the United States. It had been imported from Canada. It really started, it took off in, in Minnesota and, and gradually spread to the other major metropolitan areas, but the, the craze began in Minnesota. So, you know, you had college programs there. You had, it was being played on the amateur level in high schools, and I think the NHL saw that and they're like, okay, hockey's really part of the culture in Minnesota, um, they were willing to to give you know groups from that area a serious look, and ultimately, um, yeah, and also Minnesota had produced some of the, the handful of U.S. born NHL players up to that point too. You know, I think remember there were no Americans playing, very few Americans in the NHL, and and the few that had had made it, a lot of them were from Minnesota, and um, so. You know, they were the league was confident that the North Stars were going to be successful, and they ultimately they were able to get a building built in a, a suburb of Minneapolis called Bloomington. They played in Bloomington, right next to Met Stadium, which was the former home of the Minnesota Twins and the Vikings. And at the time, it seemed like a good idea to put a team out there. And in the beginning, they were very successful. They were one of the better expansion teams. They're, they had a, a, a really uh, colorful character by the name of Ren Blair, who was their first GM. And he was really aggressive in making deals with the established teams. And he had a good eye for talent. He brought in players like Bill Goldsworthy, who was a winger who could score goals and was really brash and colorful, and a goalie, uh, Cesar Maniago, that they could build around who had been with the Rangers. And they even coaxed the great Gump Worsley, who was the last goalie to play without a mask, out of semi-retirement. And that group melded into a good team because 
you know, they basically, and this is, this is true, of, I think, of some of the other um, expansion teams, they melded into a good group because they had all been cast-offs from the original six teams. These were, you know, these were the, uh, the, the over-the-hill guys, the fringe talents, the, the, the has-beens, the, the bubble players who were, you know, kind of always you know, close to making it to the NHL, but, but ultimately were kind of buried in the minor leagues. And they'd never had a chance to make it. Now you had a league doubling in size from 6 to 12 teams, and they were motivated to prove that they belonged in the NHL. Yeah, you got a, you got a great quote in, uh, in your book uh, from, um, from Cesar uh, uh, Maniago. Maniago. Yeah, Maniago. Yeah, You know, basically said, you know, he, I... He, I quote, uh, talk about team unity. It was there. No one wanted to disappoint each other. And we were all there yeah. to pull our own load and mold it into a pretty good team. And, and you know, that that's no substitute for talent, right? But, uh, you know, it's hockey, um, perhaps uh, more so than, than most professional sports in this country, is, is very much um, a, a very uh, uh, strongly webbed team effort, right? Because you're talking about lines and waves of players mm-hmm. and and there's a lot of coordination and almost it's almost like a dance with the precision needed yes. to sort of run lines and stuff. And, you know, especially when somebody goes down a man and, you know, and you're in the, in the box or you're fighting for your, you know, your partner on the, on the field, on the, uh, on the ice. Uh, it's um, yeah, it is a very much of a team kind of effort. And I could see where, you know, in a six on six kind of environment, you know, anything can happen on any given day. And that sort of extra intangible, I guess, as Jimmy, the Greek would have said, um, you know, is that idea of the team, bonding and uh and coordination and uh it seems like at least in the early year or two uh it was absolutely there perhaps either out of novelty or or just frankly to your point out of um you know a, a sheer will to uh to win and being given a chance frankly for the first time uh absolutely. You know, it wasn't that many opportunities absolutely they were they they had something to prove they also and and, and Cesar Maniago had a had a funny story and a number of players that i talked to from from that era had funny stories about ren blair and he kind of um you know and this is i think probably coaches the the, the yankees probably had this with billy martin and uh, and uh, and other teams with with um with difficult coaches you know when you have a coach who's tough on you sometimes you want to perform well just to show that guy what you're made of, just to shut him up, just to, to show him, you know what, you think I'm no good, I'm going to show you. And Blair, Blair was not a great coach, but he was, um, he was, he was a good manager, not a great coach, because he didn't understand the game that well. But he, was, he, would, um, he could disrespect players in front of one another, and, and one day he, uh, he was all over Maniago, um, He'd given up a few goals, you know, in the first period, and during the first intermission, he he tore into him in the in the dressing room, and and Caesar asked to talk to the coach outside in the hallway, and he told him, "If you ever talk to me like that again in front of the other players, I'm gonna put my fist down your throat." And from that moment on, they were the best of friends because someone had stood up to him and set him straight. And I I think. I think Blair didn't really know how to talk to his players. Um, but, you know, the guys, you know, as much as they, they pulled together because they were all, you know, they'd all been kind of NHL cast-offs from the other teams, they also pulled together because, you know, they had a coach who was a little crazy and they needed to stick together. And he gave them somebody that they could, he could be the villain. Um, and so in his own way, he, he was, he was a, a galvanizing force for them. Well, it's interesting. We go back to the, uh, sort of the great expansion, right? You talk about all these other teams and, um, I think I know the answer to this, but, uh, given the rich sort of hockey history, uh, of Minnesota, uh, you know, you look at the other five franchises, uh, LA, Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, St. Louis, and the team that we've already had two episodes devoted to already, the what eventually became the California Golden Seals. That's with Mark. You Gretchen. had two episodes devoted to the Seals? March, uh, Mark Gretschmill uh, in our very first episode and Steve Courier in episode number 37 for those uh, newly discovering our show and want to go back in, in, into the into the vaults. By all means, please do so. Yes, I mean, you know, in many respects, that's uh, the, the, um, uh, the ultimate uh, folly, I think, uh, yeah. of that expansion. I mean, obviously, the other teams uh, stuck very strongly. Uh, and for a long period of time, and for obviously for a long time, uh, Minnesota did as well. But it's just, um, I just wonder why it took so long 
given that rich uh, collegiate history and uh, and just the passion and uh, 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 love for the game, it took so long to um, get a franchise uh, in the NHL. There in Minnesota. Yeah. Well, I think it goes back to just the the apprehension that that managers had about putting you know about expanding um, at all. You know the 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 National Hockey League was originally the National Hockey Association, and it was very much you know based in Canada. Most of the teams were based in Canada, so you know Canadians were they were really the guiding force of the NHL in the early years. So um, you know Boston was the uh, the Boston Bruins were the first, were they the first U.S. based team? I think they were. Um, and then the, the Brooklyn Americans, which, now if you've never done a show on the Brooklyn Americans, that's worth it. I don't know that you could do a full hour, but at least 20 minutes on the Brooklyn Americans. That was an interesting story and the rivalry they had with the Rangers. But, um, there were not, I mean, you, the Canadian, the Canadian franchises were, you know they were hockey royalty, and it wasn't until you got into the the you know late fifties, early sixties that they really started to to give serious consideration to expansion. They just were afraid of it. They they didn't they didn't they could not imagine a bigger league. But you know, as is always the case, um, you know the NHL now. You would have thought that 30 teams would be enough, and now they're expanding into Las Vegas, and they're going to continue to expand, and it never ends because you know the the, the temptation of that huge um, expansion fee. Um, you know, teams always fall for it, and they just want to continue to get bigger and bigger and bigger. So, um, why didn't they start in Minnesota? I think it's just I think it's just a case of you have to remember what the what the, the the hockey landscape was like um, in the the early early part of the 20th century it was very much Canada centric. I think too the uh, uh, Minnesota, by uh, contrast to the other uh, five markets that uh, the NHL expanded to in the 67 68 season, not a major market. Correct, not the not the. I right. think actually the smallest of the television markets. Yes, absolutely and, it was. Yes, and arguably you know TV. You know, clearly on the radar, I guess, in terms of importance, clearly not to what it became in the 70s and 80s. Right. But um, but I guess, you know, I, and I've seen seen a couple of quotes. It's like, hey, you know, as long as the two million dollar check clears uh, and, and and I guess it's the beginning of that sort of uh, that that magic, uh, uh, you know, the 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 this expansion money is right. It's it's uh, it's hard to break off of that sort of model, especially when it starts to work so well and continues to grow in uh, in size and importance uh, in the years the following. The almighty dollar. So let, yep. let's let's go back to uh, it says sixty. So uh, I, I don't, I don't want to overlook this Walter Bush uh, gentleman because it seems like uh, you know he's sort of the quintessential Minnesota uh, purebred hockey guy, right? Having uh, been very active in in um, amateur hockey and uh, various uh, uh, semi pro leagues and whatnot, so it almost seems like he was Mister Instant Credibility. Uh, yes. for this, this group that ultimately won out uh, to get this Minnesota franchise. Did any any thoughts about his influence, uh, at least in the early days of this franchise? Yes, um, Walter Bush was—he um, was really the rock of of that ownership group. And at the time, um, you know, the NHL—they were not keen on the. They didn't like the fact that a lot of the the ownership groups, the the prospective ownership groups, had had um, a lot of uh, what they called five percenters. You know, as in we got a, a, a huge group of, of small investors. They want to be able to work with one guy, one or two people who own the majority shares of the club. And you know, the Minnesota North Stars had uh, had an ownership group of eight people to start, eventually nine. And Walter Bush was one of the original owners. Um, he kind of gathered that group together. He held them together. They they tried to build an ownership group that that represented Minneapolis and St. Paul equally. They, they had this, this thought that you needed to have representation from both cities in order to make this franchise successful. And, and Bush, you know, he played hockey in, in high school and college, and he, was, he had run a minor pro team there. He was involved with the U.S. Olympic Committee. So he, yeah, he, he did bring instant credibility to um, to the Minnesota bid 
and um, and he was with them for many years, and and just a really sharp guy. He was he would eventually be involved with the. Uh, uh, I think he was one of the people who who brought who would ultimately bring Herb Brooks in to to coach the U.S. Olympic team in 1980. So, yeah, a guy who was in and around Minnesota hockey and USA hockey for many, many years. Yeah, and it sounds to me like it, that that was a distinguishing uh, element and certainly a good a good start. Um, well, or what seemed like a good start, right? So, I mean, I think the team, uh, you know, uh, had its debut in in uh, in '67 in October, um, but uh, was immediately beset by yes. uh, some tragedy, which. Um, you know, I think cast a pall not only on that season, but um, you know, maybe set uh, sort of the tone for a bunch of things in the NHL that came later. But maybe you want to, uh, unfortunately, talk about sort of that incident uh, in the first few months of this franchise's history. Yeah, and, and ironically, um, some 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 uh, some footage of that uh, of that event has uh, not the event, but of the game you're talking about came out. Um, yeah, that first season, the North Stars, uh, the North Stars suffered a, a, an early tragedy. A player named Bill Masterton, um, who had who had kind of bounced around the the minor leagues for a while. He had once been a Montreal Canadiens prospect, like a lot of the players back then. Couldn't crack the lineup, and and eventually, kind of, he went and took a a regular office job because he wasn't really he he, he didn't think he could make it in pro hockey. There were just so few jobs. He um, eventually came back to hockey. He played for the U.S. national team, and it was while he was playing for the U.S. national team that he got on the North Stars' radar, and they um, they acquired him from Montreal. He was um, they were playing a game, the North Stars, uh, against the California Seals, and he collided with a player. It was a, a, a routine hit. But he fell back, and his head hit the ice, and he was knocked unconscious. And um, keep in mind that back then, nobody wore helmets. Um, as crazy as it, as it seemed, not even the goalies. They didn't wear masks or helmets. And he was rushed to a local hospital, but uh, never regained consciousness. And... Uh, he was eventually taken off life, life support, and he passed away at the age of 29. And it was a uh, a, a really shocking thing for the players, other players on the team, to deal with. These were young guys, most of them in their uh, you know you know early to mid 20s. They'd never experienced anything like this, and the season was so young, and they had to deal with this. And Bill's death did lead to a wider use of helmets throughout the league, but it was very gradual. Uh, guys felt that uh, helmets were, you know, it, it, it's not, it wasn't a question of comfort. They just they felt like they didn't have a f- complete awareness of what was going on around them on the ice when they were wearing helmets. And there was also some vanity. They just felt like, you know what, I, I don't want to be perceived to be weak or soft, and I'm not going to wear one. But some guys did start to wear them. Um, a couple on the North Stars who had obviously witnessed this this terrible incident, and it was the the first and uh, only incident of a of a player dying as a result of of something that had happened during a game. And just to give you a sense of how different the times were, there was an executive with another team who was asked if if Masterton's death was a sign that the league needed to make helmets mandatory, which, by the way, they didn't, it didn't become mandatory until many years later. And this guy said in so many words that Masterton's death had only been the, the first fatality in the history of the league, so there was no need to rush into big rules changes. You know, if this had happened more than once, then it's something that we need to address. But because it's only been the first, let's not be hasty. So it wasn't until... Um, Gosh, I think seventy nine, maybe. Yeah, it, was like a, it was like eleven years later. Yeah, it took a while um, for for helmets to become mandatory, and it was only until a couple of years ago that visors became mandatory. But um, but anyway, that was that was something terrible that the, that the North Stars had to deal with. But you know, when we talk about Ren Blair, who was this you know crazy character 
who would who would yell and scream and and throw his towel on the ice and and yell at the refs and he was this, just a you know lunatic sometimes behind the bench but the job that he did in getting his players focused on their jobs and on you know kind of getting beyond the the grief of having to to bury a teammate and focus on on you know finishing out the season and try to make the playoffs um, was really that was probably his greatest moment as a coach because they did finish strong and um, uh, and they did make the playoffs. They fell to Los Angeles, but um, but uh, you know it, they they got past it. They got past it. And they the, to the point where they almost made the Stanley Cup. They were a yeah. double overtime victory away from actually making the Stanley Cup Finals in their first year, which is. You know, despite the fact that the league had expanded by half, right, uh, or you know, twice as large, still pretty sub, sub, You know, from to do that as any new team, you know, comes together, it's a it's a pretty interesting and uh, amazing feat. No, especially after that tragedy. Well, yes and no. The one interesting quirk of of the years immediately following expansion was that they, the all of the expansion teams were in one division, and all the uh, the existing teams were in the other division. So an expansion team was guaranteed to make the finals. Um, and, and, and the St. Louis Blues, which had, uh, they had, you know, really better goaltending than any of the other um, expansion teams, they managed to make the finals those, the first three years of their existence. But, um, you know, so somebody, somebody, one of those expansion teams was going to make the finals. But, yes. Um, for the North Stars to have finished as strongly as they did in light of what happened, uh, yes, impressive. Why do you? Uh, th- it, it, I'm sorry. Why, I'm sorry why do you think? That, why do you think that? I mean, in, in retrospect, I mean, and I, you know, I'm, I'm barely conscious at the, this period of time, right? But I, I don't. It, it seems a little odd to me that you would not want to, I don't know, more equitably uh, season, shall we say, these teams uh, in a more, you know. Uh, I don't know, a diverse way versus putting them all in one sort of division versus the other, you know, six. Uh, I, I, it doesn't it, it strikes me as being somewhat odd and, and huma- uh, hugely imbalanced by putting all the new teams in one place. Yeah, um, I, I think it was always envisioned from day one to be temporary. They knew that they would eventually realign that once the expansion six were a little bit better, they would realign um, kind of more along geographic lines. Interesting. Um, well, okay. So, the, so the team sort of gets running. Uh, a, a couple of th- a couple of quick things as we sort of move along. So, uh, what about the Met Center, right? So, um, my my understanding is that it was a uh, a fairly um, shall we say unimaginative architecturally oriented structure. utilitarian. <laughs> utilitarian is a great word. Yeah. Uh, you see some old pictures of it, right? It's um, not really uh, many architectural awards no. are going to be uh, no. maybe a little no. bit of a, a, a background as to sort of how this facility came into being. It seemed like it was done pretty quickly, um, but it became pretty well known and, and well regarded uh, for uh, a lot of things in, in the league uh, in terms of. Play. Yeah, um, great ice uh, players who played there said that the ice was fantastic. Um, it was there were no bad seats in the house. Uh, the design was such that um, you know, th- there were no obstructed views. So, you know, if you were just going there to watch a hockey game, I mean, that's that was pretty much it. That was what you were going to do. There were no luxury boxes, uh, you know, no frills, no, no, um, no really beautiful uh, architectural elements, no amenities. These were all things that, you know, would eventually – be a, a big problem, um, but you know, in the early going, they they um, uh, the, the the they were able to raise enough money to to build the arena on on land that was owned by the um, uh, the Metropolitan Sports Commission, which was the kind of the, the local uh, political body that 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 you know owned that property and and. Uh, uh, and kind of gave the property over to the team, and the team was able to, you know, to, to build the arena there. And then the, ultimately, the arena was was owned by the 
the sports commission. But it was it was kind of a a, a, a confusing arrangement that they had. Um, but anyway, you know, you had this this arena had the these. Uh, if you were to stand in there and look at the at the at the uh, at the seating of the arena, they were all all the seats were were uh, alternated in, in blue, uh, excuse me, green, yellow, black, and white, and it was it seemed very haphazard, a very haphazard um, arrangement. Originally, the seats were supposed to be organized. The sections were going to be organized by color. Like you go into any building and and they're organized by color. You have a red section, a blue section, whatever. Um, and and in uh, Met Center it was done differently. And it was only because they they were kind of frantically finishing this building leading up to the home opener, and the crews just kind of started putting the seats in. It didn't matter where they just put them in. So and it stayed that way. It was it was it was a weird quirk that they uh, that they kept. They never corrected it. But it was one of the things that kind of added to the charm of Met Center. And, um, you know, in the winters, in those cold Minnesota winters, the, uh, uh, they, would, they would jump. They would give cars that, that, uh, that stalled outside. They would give them a jump. Um, it was people, people who lived there and went to games on a regular basis. They might not have said that, they, that Met Center was beautiful, but they did love watching games there. Well, that's interesting, and and the, I guess the experience was good, and it's certainly uh, I guess important because that's probably what kept uh, fans coming to the coming to the arena, given the fact that they uh, kind of had a real dry patch from about seventy three through seventy nine. I guess we'll talk about that in a second, but um, I, I guess uh, some of uh, that background of those sort of lean years, shall we say, after a fairly uh, pretty impressive start, um, was this thing called the WHA. Uh, mm-hmm. Which was uh, in Minnesota's case a little too close for comfort. Yes. Uh, in the name of the Fighting Saints. Uh, what? What? what which you, I'm sure I have to assume that at some point you've done a show on that. Not yet. We on want the WHA. To, no. Absolutely on our list. We've got a, a number of different uh, uh, folks uh, in the queue for for conversations. But I mean, maybe oh, you can yeah. you can help us introduce this uh, this this crazy Rebel League. Um, oh. And yeah. and its effect on the North Stars, given that. You know, again, we go back, you know, Minnesota, relatively new to the NHL, and here comes this wacky and wild and rules-breaking WHA just a few years later. What was it, 72? Yeah. Two, uh, at a team literally in, right down the street in St. Paul. So uh, what, what effect was there on, on, the, uh, on the North Stars from the WHA that you could tell? Oh, huge impact and not a good one. Um, you know, by the by the early '70s, the North Stars were already a team in transition. A lot of the guys who'd been there in expansion were moving on, and there had been management changes and coaching changes, and and the mix was never quite that good. They couldn't really rebuild just yet, and um, and the veterans who were moved out were missed, and the young players that took their place were never quite that good, and. And by the mid to late 70s, the, the North Stars were, they were the worst team in the NHL. And attendance was down, and they found themselves in competition for business from the World Hockey Association, which was this rebel league that started up in 1972. Um, they put teams in a lot of the same markets that NHL teams, uh, where there were NHL teams. And their approach their um, their strategy was we're going to pay our players more and we're going to lure star players away from the NHL and that's how we're going to get and that's how we're going to attract the best talent and um, and so you know the North Stars found themselves in competition for business with a team in St. Paul called the Fighting Saints and they came in with a lot of fanfare they threw big money at name players to give themselves credibility. The biggest name by far was Bobby Hull, the great, you know, former Blackhawk star. Sure. So having, uh, you know, a WHA team that close by basically took the St. Paul crowd away from the North Stars. And even though um, during that period, NHL teams sometimes played exhibition t- exhibition games against um, uh, against WHA teams, the North Stars and the Fighting Saints 
never played against each other. They kind of wanted to pretend that that other team was not even there. Um, so, you know, eventually the, the WHA, they couldn't sustain what they were doing. They, they spent themselves out of business. They, they made it until 1979, and then four of the WHA teams joined the NHL. But when you um, – there, there are some really fantastic stories. It was – you know, was, look, the WHA was, was a league that it – was, it was a goon league. Uh, on too many nights, it was a goon league. There were teams that did nothing but fight. The, the, the uh, Fighting Saints were one of those teams. There were some players who, who did play for both – the North Stars and the Fighting Saints during their careers, quite a few, actually. Um, but, you know, that was a bad time for the North Stars to have to deal with competition that close by. Um, but as you, um, uh, you mentioned, you know, teams that, that were not successful, the, the, uh, the Golden Seals, while the North Stars were going through their problems, the Golden Seals had moved to Cleveland and become the Cleveland Barons. The Cleveland Barons were having some problems of their own. And something really interesting happened uh, as the WHA was falling apart. The, the Cleveland Barons were, were this other team that were struggling. They, they, were in, they couldn't even pay their players. They were in such dire straits. Um, and the, the original ownership group of the North Stars, which included Walter Bush, they wanted to get out. They were tired of, of, of losing money. They, they felt like it would be cheaper for them to just own season tickets and charter a plane to go watch North Star games than to, to continue to, to pour money into this team. They wanted to get out. And at the same time, the, the owners of the Barons, the uh, George and Gordon Gund, you know they they were they were not having a, a a good time with the barons. So they proposed the the ownership group of the North Stars proposed that they do some kind of a combination merger sale in which the owners of the barons would buy out the owners of the North Stars. The barons would fold, and then all of their players and prospects would become property of the North Stars. And they didn't get a ton of talent out of the deal, but the North Stars did add some really good players like uh, this power winger named Al McAdam and a goalie named Gilles Malash. And the merger, what it did was it eliminated a useless team in the Barons and made the North Stars stronger. And within a couple of years, the North Stars were in the Stanley Cup Finals. So that merger was to me was one of the most innovative solutions to a problem that we still see today. What do you do with a team that is always struggling in the box office and on the ice or on the field, always losing, always on the verge of bankruptcy? Um, nowadays, leagues would much rather shut down for a year, as the NHL did, and force concessions out of the players' union collective bargaining than admit that, hey, we overexpanded, we have too many teams that are failing, and we need to contract. So this, this to me was uh, something that, that uh, you never hear about. I don't know that it's ever been done in any of the other major pro leagues, but to me it was a, such an innovative, brilliant solution to, a, to an ongoing problem. So the guns got uh, ownership of the team, and <clears throat> the team then uh, essentially all of the merged assets uh, inherited and continued with uh, the Minnesota North Stars uh, logo and history books and records and all that kind of stuff, yeah? Exactly. And, you know, the other thing that happened is uh, around that time, um, you had a uh, one, of the, one of the kind of aging defensemen on the North Stars, a guy named Lou Nanny, who had been this legend, this legendary figure in Minnesota hockey. He had um, played college hockey at the University of Minnesota, played on the U.S. national team, played for the North Stars for 10 years on defense, and then, you know, really overnight went from being a player, retired, um, and became a, uh, their general manager. All the same season. And all these people who had once been his teammates now became his employees, and he, he, he 
was somebody who recognized that there was a lot of untapped potential on the college campus. You have to remember that back then, there was real stigma against the college player in the National Hockey League. General managers, they didn't want any piece of, of a college player because to them, if you were serious about playing, eventually playing in the NHL, you went through the Canadian junior ranks. You didn't bother going to school for four years. But Lou, having gone through the college system, he knew that there were players um, in college, in Minnesota, in Wisconsin, and elsewhere, these were kids who, they were serious about the game. They just happened to go a different route. And the North Stars really were one of the early innovators in looking to the college campus. And of course, you know, what happened in 1980 at Lake Placid helped. You had all these college players from New England and from Minnesota who, you know, won a gold medal. So that certainly put you know, the college player on, uh, on, on, uh, on the NHL's radar. But, but the North Stars were one of the first teams to really look at, um, at you know, college for, you know, for, uh, for potential NHL players. And the NHL dr- draft these days is filled with college players, including quite a few European players who enrolled at U.S. colleges. But I credit the North Stars for being the first team to really – to really exploit that. All right, just when it was getting interesting, let's uh, let's bring this uh, to a grinding halt, shall we? Ah, just kidding. Uh, we got to pay the bills around here, and uh, our friends at Audible have been very helpful in attempting to allow us to pay some of those bills, and uh, we want to call them out now uh, and remind you that uh, a free audiobook download is yours for the taking and also a free one-month uh, subscription to the service uh, of Audible at audibletrial.com slash goodseats. Again, audibletrial.com slash goodseats for your free one-month trial of the Audible service and, interestingly, most interestingly, a free audiobook download for you to enjoy. 180,000 titles and growing uh, every day to choose from, and there's uh, absolutely no excuse to not find at least one title amongst that uh, cavernous uh, selection uh, available to you that uh, you won't find to be enjoyable and uh, and good for the soul, including uh, a couple of books that might be interesting to our audience. And yes, some new ones, frankly, uh, that I'm finally listening to. One that I'm listening to right now uh, is by Carson Cunningham. It's narrated by Paul Bamer, and it's called Underbelly Hoops, Adventures in the CBA, a.k.a. The Crazy Basketball Association, which is really, of course, about the Continental Basketball Association, which for many years was sort of this ragtag minor league uh, of the NBA. And that's uh, it's a book I'm about two chapters into right now, and uh, hopefully maybe a guest will get uh, for a future episode. Also, uh, in my queue, next up uh, is another guest that I'd like to get, uh, and her book that she wrote is also uh, narrated by her. Her name is Jeannie Buss. And of course, Jeannie is the daughter of Jerry Buss, of course, the uh, wildly successful founder of the Los Angeles Lakers and the L.A. Forum. And Jeannie is uh, is clearly today the brains behind uh, the Los Angeles Lakers today. Uh, She and her brothers were uh, active, of course, in things like, along with her father, uh, World Team Tennis, uh, the Major Indoor Soccer League with the L.A. Lasers, all kinds of stuff. So uh, her book is next on my list. That's called Laker Girl. And that, too, is available on Audible. And again, it's one of the uh, the many thousands of titles that you can choose from uh, when you go to audibletrial.com slash goodseats. And again, you too can get your free audiobook download to give it a try, perhaps one of those two, or perhaps one of the other 180,000 titles uh, available to you as well. Uh, give it a try, audibletrial.com slash goodseats. Thanks for listening and back to our conversation. The merger clearly seemed to be a catalytic uh, event for the franchise because as you talk about in your book and you actually title the chapter, actually the the, pri- the previous chapter is called Fighting for Respect, but uh, starting with 1978 or so and lasting through a good, you know, through the 80s and m- much, you know, uh, and a little bit into the early 90s, uh, your next uh, section of the book is called Flirting with Greatness. And uh, it wasn't too long thereafter, uh, I think two seasons actually, where they yep. were back again in the Stanley Cup finals, right? So... Something 
something seemed to, I, I mean, is it too easy to kind of just point to that sort of, that merger as being sort of uh, the, the event that kind of kick-started the franchise out of its, uh, shall we say, more abundantness? Well, it was a combination of things. You know, you finish dead last, you're going to get, you're going to have access to some, um, you're going to put yourself in line to get some really good draft picks. And, um, you know, the North Stars were able to draft this really tremendous Canadian junior prospect named Brian Bellows. They got Neil Broughton, who had been on the 80 Olympic team. They, uh, they signed a young player named Dino Cicerelli, who had become this one of the great goal scorers of, of the 80s. They had a tremendous playmaker in Bobby Smith, an offensive defenseman who could kind of control the tempo of the game in Craig Hartsburg. And they, had, they, they started to really put together, and Al McAdam and Gilles Malash, who they had gotten in the merger. They, they built a really solid nucleus, and, uh, and they did make it to the 1981 finals on kind of a Cinderella run. They had the misfortune, though, of facing the New York Islanders, who were in the middle of their run of four consecutive cups, and, and they went down in five games. But, you know, it was a way of, of kind of letting the league know. They served notice that, hey, this is a young, up-and-coming team with some spunk that had some offensive skill and some toughness that they were going to be a team to be reckoned with. The only you know the problem with with a lot of teams in in the uh in the west at that time was that you know it was the 1980s and no team other than Calgary or Edmonton was going to get out of the west um they were just so much better than everybody else you know Edmonton with Wayne Gretzky and Mark Messier and the Flames with uh you know with uh, Doug Gilmore and and Al McInnes, and they were so good. And the North Stars, um, you know, it was always going to be it was always going to be an uphill battle for them. There was always somebody as good as they were, as exciting as they were. They're, they always seemed to run into teams in the playoffs that were just a little bit better. Their biggest rivals by far during that time were the Chicago Blackhawks, and um, their Playoff meetings were wars, and part of it was geography. Minnesota and Chicago being not that far from each other, and you know certainly the Vikings and Bears have their rivalry. But um, Minnesota and Chicago met six times overall, including four years in a row. The Blackhawks won four of six playoff series, and they had guys like Al Secord and Denny Savard and Steve Larmer who were just absolutely reviled. You know public enemies in Minnesota. That was one of the great rivalries in the history of hockey, though, you know, unfortunately kind of short-lived. But during that period, you know, the North Stars just, you know, they, they would have a good regular season. They would meet a slightly better team in the playoffs and go out. And they just never had that one superstar, that one great leader to put them over the top. Yeah, and it seemed that you know, even with a couple of changes and a more defensive-minded uh, coach in, in Bill Mahoney, um, you know, and and a couple of trades, some of which were not necessarily popular, um, yeah. it almost feels like they got close um, or were at least competitive but could, could, couldn't sort of fully put it together. So maybe you could take us into the mid to late 80s when, um, I don't know if it went sideways again, but it certainly seemed that uh, in many respects the team was never sort of going to get over that I guess that sort of next playoff plateau or or hump. No, that was kind of a, a a dark, uneventful era. They had a lot of coaching changes. It was you know behind and that that didn't help. You had a lot of guys in and out behind the bench, and um, and ultimately the North Stars did bottom out again. But it gave them the opportunity to draft a player who would really not just revitalize the franchise, but um, you know, you could make a case from being the, the best American-born player ever in Mike Madonna, who, you know, had the uh, – brought a level of skill that I don't think anybody had ever seen from an American player up to that point, a guy who, who was, you know, a tremendous offensive player, fast, um, could make plays, 
And he was the guy, he was, the, he was a can't-miss prospect. And, you know, up, up until that point, they'd had a few, you know, quote-unquote can't-miss prospects like Brian Lawton, who, you know, ultimately didn't work out. But Madonna was the real deal. And by the, you know, by, uh, you know, by 1991, he was, you know, he was a guy that they were, they were confident they could, they could build around. And, and in 91, you know, things kind of, you know, in terms of, you know, on the ice, there were, there were still lingering financial problems, but at least on the ice, you started to see a big turnaround. All right. Well, so let's let's talk about that though, because uh, clearly on the ice, that's that's certainly a spark, but it didn't seem to necessarily translate into better attendance. Um, no. I guess my first question before we get into what then immediately happened thereafter, which is a, a torturous story that I, I'd, I'd love you to walk us through gingerly. Um, why do you think uh, the what, what what do you think the 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 reasons for um, I don't know what seemed to be relatively poor support at the gate. I mean, obviously the fighting saints had long gone with the, with the WHA. I mean, was it just, uh, you know, was it apathy? I mean, again, it's a hockey rich environment. You think that, uh, you know, the Timberwolves weren't even really sort of, uh, you know, in, in play yet. Um, why do you think the, uh, the team was not uh, supported more robustly or was it maybe the guns kind of angling for other things and maybe sort of making the situation seem more dire than it really was? It was a lot of things. It was um, it was in part that the guns were um, they were angling to move the team. Um, it was around the late eighties, early nineties. You started to hear whispers that the owners uh, that the Gun Brothers were tired of losing money and they wanted to move the team to California. And at the same time, and I'll, and I'll get to, you asked about, you know, what other factors might have contributed to the, the, the attendance issue, and I'll, I'll, I'll sort of get into that. But, um, you know, at the time, the league was looking to expand into California. So they, they came up with this kind of complicated arrangement where they, they were going to sell the North Stars to the former uh, Hartford Whaler owner, Howard Baldwin um, and his and his business partner at a reduced rate, and then they'd be given an expansion team in California, which we know today as the Sharks. and um, And it was a it was a partner owner of the Calgary Flames named Norm Green who who came into the picture around this time. And Norm was a Canadian businessman who'd made his money in real estate, building shopping malls. And Norm had been a, a part owner of the Calgary Flames, and he'd been following this drama with the North Stars at the Board of Governors meetings, and he ultimately sold his interest in the Flames so that he could become part owner of the North Stars. When the other owners, when Howard Baldwin and his partner started to have financial problems, Norm Green bought them out, and he became the sole owner of the North Stars. Initially, he was very excited he knew that the team had been losing money for years, but he figured it was due to mismanagement. Now, to your point about you know what what factors might have contributed to the low attendance and why weren't people coming to games and stuff, you know, part of it was look, you know, Met Center. Once you get into the 80s, 90s, teams wanted those amenities like luxury boxes, those revenue generating things, and, and Met Center didn't have that. But how did um, how did Minnesota, which was the birthplace of hockey in the U.S., lose an NHL team? Why didn't fans fill that building every night and make it impossible for Green to move the team? I think there are a lot of theories. Um, tickets were cheap. There wasn't a bad seat in the house, and there was plenty of parking. But playing out in Bloomington in the suburbs didn't help. Um, you would never do that today. You wouldn't put a team out. You'd, you'd have a team right downtown where everybody could get to it. Um, the Vikings had already moved downtown. Um, I think it was also that there was so much hockey being played in Minnesota. High school is huge there. College hockey is huge. That it was easy for the North Stars to get lost in the shuffle, especially when they weren't winning. 
And you had these other attractions at the time that were vying for people's discretionary income, like the casinos and this massive new mall of America that they built just across the way. So, you know, and the economy had been flat, flat for a while. So there were a lot of there were a lot of reasons. There was no one reason why people weren't flocking to North Stars games and making it impossible for the Guns or Norm Green to 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 talk about moving the team. So, so the Gun Brothers essentially they they washed their hands of it and they're in San Jose. And I, I, yes. I, my understanding is they also got some players via some kind of dispersal draft of sorts. That allowed- they did. They didn't get anybody great. Um, the North Stars didn't really lose any 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 um, any significant talent in that deal. Okay, and the irony, of course, is that you know if you go back to our original conversations about the California Golden Seals, right? There's there's some diaspora there, right? Because if you think about it, it's almost like a full circle from yep. that team into the Barons and then into the North Stars, and then ironically, some of those players, although obviously not some of the players from the Golden Seals, but at least the legacy and the flow, you know, goes back to San Jose and the Bay Area. So it's an interesting sort yep. of little weird little circle of, of, of life, I guess. But I, I, my interpretation, though, then, is that it seems that that, that Norman Green is sort of this um, opportunistic savior, maybe, in the process of the guns finding a buyer and then that buyer essentially not being able to fully complete the deal and or yeah. go forward. Um, why do you think somebody like Green, who uh, arguably had some success in, uh, and maybe even uh, hauntingly, uh, Finding a team in another city, that being the Atlanta Flames, moving them to Calgary. Um, why was the league involved in maybe trying to get him to get uh, more involved in this, or did, was he just uh, wily, if you will, and uh, and an opportunistic, as I said, uh, pouncing on a situation that he thought was undervalued, poorly managed, et cetera? Wily and opportunistic, and also uh, one of the one of the um, uh, one of the people involved in the sale that fell through Morris Bellsberg had actually been a childhood friend of Norm Green. So he, he was very close to the situation. He was able to see what was going on. He wanted to be the sole owner of a team. He could, he couldn't be the sole owner in Calgary. So, um, I think he saw a situation, he saw an opportunity and he thought that he could come in and make the North stars profitable from the get go. He thought it was just a question of mismanagement. And he came in and he made a lot of bold predictions about he was going to come in, he was going to turn things around, and he was going to make it a profitable, profitable business. The problem is Norm did not really understand what he was up against. It was, it was a, a fan base there that was loyal but never big enough to sell out the building. And there were political leaders who were really more focused on getting new facilities built for the Twins and Vikings downtown rather than pay for improvements to Met Center, um, you know, which he did not own. That's the other, you know, the North Stars in that rapidly aging rink out in Bloomington were becoming an afterthought. And Norm, you know, he wanted to, he had some ideas like he wanted to develop the land around Met Center and add some retail, which he knew a lot about to offset the losses um, that he was incurring with the hockey team. And he wanted the city essentially to give him the land to do that. And they wouldn't do it. They looked at it as a sort of bailout. And they also wouldn't pay for upgrades to Met Center. So it was a tough situation. But Norm also made it harder on himself by making a lot of inappropriate comments towards his female employees, some of whom went public with stories about things that he'd said and done around the office and the kinds of things that make someone look like a real pig. And from that point on, he became this very easy target, this slick out-of-towner who rode in acting like a a knight in shining armor who now had to deal with a sexual harassment suit from a woman who worked for him who was from a very prominent local family that was, you know, well-connected politically. Norm had no allies. He had nobody to rush to his defense. So the media there absolutely destroyed him. So am I correct in in what I've determined, you probably have done more research than I have, of course, but um, it's, uh, it, do I have this right that when the Board of Governors, uh, the NHL Board of Governors uh, granted him um, 
well, he officially, you know, basically approved the the sale and, and and giving him ownership control. Did they also give him the right to switch or move to another city, like at that same time, like within a, a short period of time? And and or, or do I have no? That was later. Okay, it, it was, was later. later. They 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 ultimately they did give him um, they did give him a window to to move the team. There had been rumors for a couple of years that he was quietly scouting out possible locations to move the team. And at one point he looked at Anaheim, um, but the NHL approved an expansion team for that city. So Anaheim was out and eventually Anaheim obviously got the ducks. Um, he, he did have a window of opportunity to move the team during which he said, look, if we sell enough season tickets, I'll keep the team here. They didn't, they didn't sell enough. Um, they looked at options in Minneapolis and St. Paul, but none of those were good enough. There was still kind of this glimmer of hope that the North Stars, they might leave Bloomington, but they would at least stay in Minnesota. But they could never work out a deal that was to everybody's liking. So, you know, during this time, Dallas, Texas, became this attractive option because they really wanted a team. And the NHL wanted to have a presence there. So Dallas, you know, Dallas was a major media market. The NHL had this fascination with expanding into the South. So people from Dallas, uh, including uh, former Cowboys quarterback Roger Staubach, convinced Norm that the North Stars would do really well there. And, um, you know, ultimately when it was announced that he was going to move the team to Dallas to start the 93-94 season, a lot of people in Minnesota were convinced that it was his embarrassment over the sexual harassment suit. You know, if it wasn't the number one reason, then it was certainly the, the last straw that pushed him, up, that pushed him out. All right, so been- He's always maintained that it was strictly a financial issue, that it was losing millions keeping the team in Bloomington. At one point, I think he claimed losses of around $24 million since purchasing the team, but, um, but, uh, you know, he was just, uh, vilified. I've never seen an owner, with the exception of maybe Walter O'Malley when he moved the Dodgers, Norm Green was, uh, was public enemy number one there for a while. Well, okay. But so I get what I'm trying to do is piece this, this together, right? I mean, he, he, he apparently, uh, got to ownership of the team in, in, in late 1990, October, I guess. And yeah. we'll talk about the 99, 91 season in a second, but, um, but by 92, he was already angling for that Anaheim LA thing. Yeah. Um, and by the early part of 93, uh, Dallas was, was in the mix and, uh, and, and basically announced. So, I, you know, I, and I get it moved pretty fast. Well, it yeah, definitely say, moved pretty fast. So I'm, so there, there's my question, right? So, and I'm sure there's some conspiracy theorists uh, in Minnesota who will probably say that it was already in motion way, even before perhaps he even got full ownership of the team. Uh, what do you think was in his mind? Obviously, you mentioned the sexual harassment thing, okay, and that's clear. But do you think he would he had these these machinations in mind early on, or or to your point, maybe earlier, he did try to make a, a, an honest go of it, and just it seems rapid to 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 go from one extreme, if you will, to the other, if you weren't maybe stretching the truth, lying, angling to do something else, et cetera. If you believe the claim of losses 24 million in such a short period of time just a couple of years um when you consider that you know, i mean 24 million is a lot of money now it was even more money uh back then in the early 90s uh yeah maybe maybe you do start to look around if you if you've got a team in this hockey hotbed and and they go to the Stanley Cup finals and the next year you're still not drawing 10 not averaging 10,000 a game Maybe you do consider that this is not the right place. Maybe if I can't get a new building and the, the, my, my civic landlords will not let me develop the land around the arena to try to offset the losses I'm incurring, um, you know, maybe you do start looking around. Certainly the, the speed with which things fell apart looks suspicious. Um, you know, the sexual harassment suit, uh, bad timing, <laughs> really bad timing. But, um, 
you know, he did things. He did, I think he really did try to make a go of it. He Maybe he didn't try as hard as he could have. And maybe, um, maybe he could have used a little bit more help from, from the city of Bloomington and, and the state of Minnesota. Maybe something could have been worked out. But I, ultimately, I feel like if the building had always been full, cheapest tickets among the cheapest tickets in the league, um, if the building had always been full, it would have been impossible for him to move the team. And um, he got himself into a lot of trouble with his 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 big mouth, and um, and he made a lot of really bold promises that he he couldn't keep. But I do think that he tried to make a go of it there, and um, I don't think that he wanted to move the team from day one. Do you think the NHL was complicit? Because um, it almost seems like they gave him a few. Um you know, free passes on a couple of different levels, especially after the uh, approach, I guess, for Anaheim, Disney coming in and basically saying, we want that franchise. I, I get the sense the NHL kind of said, well, okay, let's let Disney have this, but where else do you want to go? Right? Without their help, right? Yeah. Unfortunately, you know, as we've seen the NHL, they don't, nowadays, they don't really care where they put a team. They'll put a team in Atlanta, Nashville, Columbus, uh, two teams in Florida, one of which their building is empty on most nights. I, I don't, I don't think they really care much where they put teams. They look at which markets, where where does a market rank in terms of its, uh, you know, in terms of its its Nielsen ratings. Where where's where does this rank? And if it's if it ranks high and doesn't already have a team, they'll look at putting a team there. Whether or not it can support pro hockey. Whether or not there's any kind of foundation, um, you know, of support there doesn't really matter. So losing Minnesota, just like losing Quebec and losing Winnipeg, I don't think was a was a tremendous deal. I don't I don't know if they were complicit, but I, look, they clearly wanted to have a team in Dallas. They wanted to have, they wanted more teams down south. I live in the Greater Hartford area, and you know, they they were delighted to you know, move the whalers out of Hartford into, into North Carolina. Um, and incidentally, my wife would be willing to come on the show to talk about how she was a junior whaler as a kid, as a kid, she was a huge whaler fan. But, um, but the, when, you know, when the team moved, I don't think they really much cared. They were getting what they wanted. They were getting a team into a bigger media market. Yeah. Well, okay. I, I a couple of quickies on this. So, uh, the Target Center, right, was uh, kind of coming into play. Uh, Norm Greed, as he was known, um, yeah. pushed back on that, right? But I, it seemed like it kind of, I don't know, I, what I read is that there were, I guess, soft drink pouring rights that were kind mm-hmm. of in contention that maybe yep. that prevented. But I, that seems a little nonsensical to me that, you know, if you're bra- building a brand new building, to your point, in the heart of downtown of one of the Twin Cities, right, new mm-hmm. facility... You know, uh, why wouldn't that be an option? Yeah, there were all kinds of different offers, you know, different, you know, you, you share X share of concessions. And, um, you know, some of these, some of the offers that came through were it was almost too little too late. And maybe once he'd made up his mind that he was leaving, um, you know, by this point, he would heard the norm sucks chance. Uh, he couldn't show his face in the Twin Cities area. I think, you know, it got to a point where he was treated so badly by the fans and and by the press in particular, who he kind of, he kind of felt the media owed him one. He felt the media, it was the media's job to promote the team and to to paint him in a positive light. And I think there was some bruised ego involved. So even if there was a deal to be made there, it got to a point where it was, it was, he wasn't going to, he wasn't going to look at it. All right, well, maybe we can sort of round the corner here with some uh, two ironies uh, here. Um, one irony is even before they left. You want to talk about the 1991, almost, uh, let's call it Cinderella season? Because that seemed to go against the grain of the story. Yeah. Um, in the midst of all of this, when you kind of had the, the, the talk of, of relocating, hovering in the background, um, 
you had Bob Gainey, who was uh, who had once been this great player with the Montreal Canadiens, a great defensive forward, now coach, first coaching job in the NHL, and he was behind the bench for the North Stars, and they got off to kind of a mediocre start. They had a lot of injuries, but then later in the season, things started to come together, and led by a, a young Mike Badano, the North Stars get into the playoffs. They managed to beat their hated rivals from Chicago, who had the best record overall in the league that season. They they beat the second best team in the league, the St. Louis Blues. They beat the defending champion Edmonton Oilers in the conference finals. Um, They did it all by having just absolutely lights-out special teams. Their power play and their penalty kill were were just outstanding. And, um, And they went on this tremendous run through the playoffs, beating these hated rivals and the defending champion en en route to the the Stanley Cup Finals. And, you know, unfortunately, what happens with most Cinderella teams, eventually the luck runs out. They made it to the Stanley Cup Finals and faced the Pittsburgh Penguins. And the Penguins beat them in six games. You know, the North Stars, they were without one of their best players. Brian Bellows had gotten hurt. The Penguins were just loaded with future Hall of Fame players. You know, Mario Lemieux, Yarmir Yager, Ron Francis, Paul Coffey, Larry Murphy. Uh, uh, you know, they were just – the gap in talent was, was just too great, and the Penguins won. But that would end up being kind of the last really enjoyable moment for North Stars fans because after that – it just became this constant focus on will they leave, will they stay, where are they going to go, are they going to move downtown, are they going to stay here, are they going to go to California. But that run, that Stanley Cup run, was um, was was just kind of a um, – it was the closest they, the team ever came to a Stanley Cup. They fell short, but um, but I think it's probably the the last kind of really great memory that North Star fans have of their team. And the second irony is after the move to Dallas when they were renamed the Stars, although I thought they were going to call themselves the Lone Stars for a period of time, mm. which I thought actually would be a better name, frankly. But Yeah, yeah. Um, but the irony is that Norm Green didn't last very long as the owner once the move was made, right? He ran into financial problems, ironically. Yeah, yeah. and, you know, it's funny. Um, you know, the... Yeah, he sold the team after he moved to uh, he moved the team to Texas in in 1993, and this billionaire venture capitalist named Jim Light um, named uh, um, Tom Hicks. Tom Hicks, thank you. Jim Lights was his general manager. Tom Hicks bought the team, and he was you know he's someone who was willing to pour a lot of money into the team, and the combination of the talent that the the North Stars brought with them to Texas, um, having Bob Gainey as coach and the free agents that that Hicks was willing to spend money on. Six years after landing in Dallas, the the former Minnesota North Stars won the Stanley Cup, and it was something. You know, when they moved to Texas, the the sports writers in Minnesota were like, "This is the worst move ever." This team will not be successful. They won't last in Dallas. Um, Texans will never embrace the sport. But you look at the you know the late '90s and well into the 2000s, the Dallas Stars were one of the one of the elite franchises in the league, and a big reason why is because number one, they had an owner that was willing to spend whatever it took to make them successful, but also they built themselves a nice you know a nice solid fan base originally not that savvy when it came to the sport they needed some they needed some um they needed some instruction on the finer points of the game you know this was a fan base didn't know what icing was didn't know what offsides was so they you know the 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 ownership was willing to um uh to be patient with them and they gave them an opportunity to kind of learn the game gradually but look they went out and they they got free agents like Ed Belfour and and uh, and Brett Hull, and they built a a championship team. And while this was going on, ironically, uh, Minnesota got itself a team again. It was it was Gordon.
Gordon Gund, the, the former owner, had once told the other governors, you need to let us move the North Stars because Minnesota doesn't really want a team. Once, we, once they don't have a team, a team, then they'll want an expansion team. And he was right. And when the NHL announced it was going to expand to 30 teams, Minnesota got a team. And the Minnesota Wild has uh, a world-class arena in downtown St. Paul. Their attendance is great. They branded themselves as a team for all Minnesotans. They fully embrace the history of hockey in the state, and that history includes the North Stars. They don't see themselves as being in competition with the University of Minnesota or the high school programs out there, which are among the most competitive in the nation. They're, they're just, they are willing to embrace everything that Minnesota hockey stands for, and they've honored North Stars alumni on many occasions. You can even see the North Star in the eye of the wild animal on the crest of their uniforms. So there's a real legacy there. Um, it's funny, though. There are Minnesota Wild fans who, who wish that their team would be called the North Stars. There is still um, uh, tremendous nostalgia for the North Stars. I think they'd love to see the, the old logo, the old uniforms. They wish that the, the team history, the same way the, kind of the Winnipeg Jets had carried over, uh, when the Atlanta, uh, Atlanta Thrashers moved to Winnipeg and became the Jets, I think they kind of had wished that the, the new franchise in Minnesota had been known as the North Stars. But um, there's, always that little, there's always that little bit of legacy there with the Wild. And um, uh, people there have not completely forgotten the North Stars. Well, you mentioned in your preface of your book um, <clears throat> a, uh, an incident in 2010 when you went to the Winter Classic at Fenway Park. And- <laughs> You, you yeah. want to tell the audience what you were wearing and, and sort of what what sort of transpired? Yeah, yeah. it was a uh, it was a game at um, at Fenway Park. It was uh, Philadelphia Flyers versus the Boston Bruins. I did not have any vested interest in the game. I'm not a fan of either team, but you know, me being the, the fan of the history of the game, I wore a you know bright green. Minnesota North Star jersey, Dave Gagne, um, definitely stood out in that crowd. And the reaction that I got all day was pretty funny. Um, Boston fans walking up to me wanting to take a picture with me, and uh, not so much the Philly fans, which doesn't surprise me. But, um, uh, you know, that's, but see, that's the thing. I love the passion that fans of hockey have for the history of the game. You would, I don't know that you would see that in any other sport. They, they saw it, that logo, the, the colors, the bright green and yellow, and it just, it, it, there's something about it. We talked about this earlier, you know, you, something, there's something childlike about it. There's some, um, something very innocent and pure and, and beautiful about that, about the, the, the attachment we have to the players, the leagues, the teams, the uniforms from our childhood, and uh, I felt a little bit like a celebrity that day. It was it was a lot of fun, and um, and I loved, and it kind of also convinced me that I made the right choice. That even though this was not the most popular subject to write about, you know, there aren't publishers are not knocking down my door looking for books on defunct hockey teams, um, but I kind of felt like you know what there is there is a niche out there, there is an audience for this kind of thing. And, uh, and I realized in that moment, you know what, this was, uh, this was, um, this was the right subject to, to write about. It was, a, it was a lot of fun to explore the subject of the North Stars. I learned a lot. I had countless great conversations with, you know, former players, fans, front office people. Um, it was just a tremendous experience. And, it's it's actually hard to believe that you know I started this book probably my god 16 17 years ago didn't come out until 2014 and uh, and here we are 2018 talking about it well look I, this is partially the reason why we we sort of do these um <clears throat> do these shows i the you know th- there's history there right so you know it it's mostly forgotten history or or uh uh watered down history um, but these are things that are still integral to uh, the modern day versions of of the sports and the teams and the leagues that we uh, enjoy or or revile today. And you know, it's interesting. I think the North Stars. I mean, you could 
uh, you could have a successful argument by saying as many as three teams in today's current AHL have some, uh, shall we say, uh, true relationship or uh, could be accorded that uh, to the North Stars franchise. Clearly, the Minnesota Wild, because that's the the newer team in town, and and people who of a certain age may remember the original NHL franchise, and 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 in many respects has taken over that market in a new and modern way. Certainly, the Dallas Stars, right, because that's where the team wound up, and 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 ultimately all the records and all those kinds of things from the old North Stars went with them, and arguably is the continuous. Uh, franchise, and you can even make the argument the San Jose Sharks, right? We talked about the Seals and the Barons and and the merger into that. And I think, frankly, to your point earlier, you know, a lot of people forget that stuff. And that's, you know, that there there are, you know, th- that's part of the diaspora, that's part of the lineage. Um, and you know, to me, that's uh, a, a bit of a rich uh, a grain or two of, uh, you know, of the woodwork that is the NHL. And you know, we can argue and debate and or um, you know, wrinkle our noses, I guess, at uh, today's sort of modern day cash grab and, you know, how authentic a Las Vegas Golden Knights franchise is, despite their success on the ice this year, strangely and interestingly, um, mm-hmm. you know, uh, perhaps beyond uh, all uh, all rational uh, belief. Um, but, you know, these are it, it's part of the rich tapestry of the sport. And um, and there's just so many other stories similar to that. But, I, you know, without sort of at least investigating you de- dedicating some time in this book, uh, sort of uh, going a little deeper in, in our little hour plus here to discuss it. Um, you know, I don't know. This, it's kind of it's kind of interesting to me to to kind of sort of remember some of these things and understand maybe what these contributions and what you know what the legacies, small as they might be, uh, have become. Well, yes, I couldn't agree more. And um, and I know that you are a soccer fan, and I um, I do vaguely remember the New York Cosmos from my childhood. And um, I think one of these days I'm going to go back and listen to any programs that you've done on the Cosmos because um, I do want to learn more about that time. And I know that it was a tremendous franchise and uh, with, with a, a colorful history of its own. And uh, and I think this is a tremendous program and, and a tremendous uh, uh, pursuit that you've got. I can't help thinking, though, about this one line from a U2 song, um, you, you know, you glorify the past when the future dries up, and I hope that that there are some that there are some good uh, stories about pro sports ahead of us, and that not all of the great stories are behind us. Again, I uh, I, I constantly am amazed at what I learn uh, in these conversations, uh, and. Uh, Adam Rader has uh, uh, regaled us with some very interesting stories, uh, some of which I knew, some of which I thought I knew, and some of which I didn't know uh, about uh, a very important team in the history of the uh, National Hockey League, uh, as we've talked about, uh, literally living on in three different teams of today's current NHL, uh, and that being the Minnesota North Stars. Uh, A very uh, compelling story. I hope uh, some of you folks up in the uh, Minnesota area uh, either current Wild fans, uh, perhaps San Jose Shark fans, and certainly Dallas Stars fans, uh, got a little bit of a taste of uh, some of the lineage uh, that is uh, actually part of the DNA of your respective teams. Uh, the book is called Frozen in Time, a Min- no- excuse me, a Minnesota North Stars History. You'd think I'd uh, know the title by now. Uh, it is published by our friends at University of Nebraska Press. And uh, you can uh, get it, of course, wherever good books are found. And uh, in particular... If you'd like to show us some love uh, uh, and uh, give us a few shekels uh, for doing so, make sure that you go to goodseatsstillavailable.com and make sure you search for episode 53. You will see uh, our uh, little synopsis of the show. Uh, You'll see some great uh, imagery there. And you, of course, find links uh, to the book. And, of course, we'll get a a very minimal amount of of referral love uh, if you were to uh, be kind enough to do so. And uh, I know Adam would be uh, ecstatic to... uh, to, to see you buy a couple of copies of the book, too, for God's sake. So please do so. Uh, buy a few for your friends and neighbors. Why not? Again, it's Frozen in Time, a Minnesota North Stars history. Again, he mispronounces it, but I think you know what I mean. University of Nebraska Press is the publisher. And uh, uh, we thank uh, Rosemary Sakura and all the good people at uh, the University of Nebraska Press uh, for their uh, help in getting us 
uh, connected with Adam and uh, and this, uh, I think, fun uh, and very interesting uh, conversation about the North Stars. Uh, before we run, I want to say thank you, uh, not only to you, the listeners, uh, because uh, you keep us going, uh, but also to our friends at Podfly Productions, uh, Eric Begay, Corey Coates, David Gregerson, and of course, the inimitable, the one, the only good doctor, Jerry Payne, uh, who I think we're going to, we have uh, a couple of inquiries to perhaps actually uh, start uh, a fan club uh, for. Uh, and this is interesting because uh, people don't even know perhaps what, even what Jerry looks like. Uh, they know very little about him except for the banter that we talk about here on the show. Uh, but I think it's just amazing that uh, uh, a handful of you out there, okay, two, have uh, 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 maybe semi-jokingly said, uh, where is the uh, the Dr. Jerry Payne fan club? So uh, perhaps we're, we're on to something here, but uh, Jerry obviously goes uh, out of his way uh, each and every week to... Uh, to massage this, uh, these uh, those little recording components and and make them somewhat listenable. So I always, of course, uh, am indebted uh, gratitude to uh, to Jerry for uh, his efforts. So we uh, we thank him and our friends at Podfly Productions. And again, if you're thinking about getting into podcasting or you're a good podcaster yourself and you need some help with engineering and uh, editorial and uh, putting all this stuff together, Podfly.net. Again, Podfly.net. Uh, you cannot go wrong by considering them for for your services. Tell them I sent you. Tell them Good Seats Still Available sent you. Tell them whoever sent you, but uh, just just go and and, and give them a, give them some consideration, will you? And uh, while you're surfing the web, as they as the kids say, uh, make sure that you uh, subscribe to us, follow us, uh, etc., on our various social media platforms. That's the best way, at least for now. Uh, we'll get into newsletters. We'll get into uh, some other fun promotional stuff. But for now, make sure you go to Twitter and you'll find us at Good Seats Still. Uh, you'll find us on Instagram at Good Seats Still Available. Uh, you will also find a Facebook page devoted to the show. Uh, and again, the website, in case you forget any of that, or you just want to lose a whole bunch of time by looking at all the old episodes uh, and downloading and enjoying them and all the imagery that comes with them that we put up there, that's Good Seats Still Available. Dot com. Uh, go there early. Go there often. We thank you for doing so. Thank you for listening. We'll talk to you again next week. God knows what topic, but uh, I, I promise uh, it'll be similarly interesting. Thank you for listening, everybody. Take care. <laughs>